Hello, and this presentation is called, What is Sexual Selection? And Darwin coined the term sexual selection in 1859 in The Origin of Species, where he defined it as a kind of selection that depended not on the struggle for survival, the struggle for existence, but rather on a struggle between the males for possession of the females. And he argued that this would probably be a less vigorous kind of selection for that reason. So in Darwin's work and in his thinking, there was a clear distinction between what he called natural selection and sexual selection. Most evolutionary thinkers today uh, simply see sexual selection as a variant a variant kind of analysis uh, that's part of natural selection. And here's an example. Uh, here's some male elephant seals fighting for mates. And this is no doubt what we most often associate with this from nature shows. And here's an even more dramatic uh, picture of those males battling it out. And indeed, a study of a, a group of male elephant seals with 14 bulls. In one season, 26 pups were sired. 11 of the bulls sired no pups at all. Two sired just one each. And one bull sired 24 of the 26 pups. And that's a tremendous example of what's called reproductive skew. And that's when reproductive success isn't evenly distributed over a population of individuals. But some individuals uh, have more than their share of reproductive success. A variety of things can accompany male-male mate competition. And one thing that we often find in polygynous mammals is sexual dimorphism in size. So male-female size differences often become more pronounced if males are monopolizing numbers of females and some males aren't able to reproduce. And an example of this is silverback gorillas. Uh, gorillas are polygynous and live in harems with one male and many females. And male silverbacks are twice as big as females. Now in humans, sexual dimorphism has actually decreased uh, steadily over the last two million years. But it's not just size or strength. So again, uh, if we think about nature documentaries, we're thinking about uh, males fighting it out for mates. Um, but any trait that leads to higher levels of reproductive success uh, can be sexually selected for. And Darwin's interest wasn't so much in the battle of males to access females, um, what he was interested in was maladaptive traits, and the most famous one is the male peacock and his massive tail. And Darwin noted this could, have been, could not have been the product of natural selection, because how would this confer greater survival in escaping predators or something like that? Instead, it must have been the product of sexual selection. So he notes of the peacock's tail and other examples that he lists, right, that these characters are the result of sexual and not ordinary selection. So we can make this distinction that Darwin made, right, his logic was that ordinary natural selection was different from sexual selection. And the heart of this was that natural selection was about fitness in the struggle for survival, whereas sexual selection was fitness in the struggle to attract mates. And this is a kind of problematic uh, distinction in some ways, because ultimately all that matters is reproductive success. If you survive and don't reproduce, uh, your genes won't be represented in the next generation. So reproductive success is terribly important, but nonetheless, Darwin's distinction led to a focus on what we call sexual selection today. All right. And again, this distinction between natural selection and sexual selection isn't made as strongly by contemporary evolutionary thinkers as it was made by Darwin. 
So Darwin's idea was that males acquired their present structure not from being better fitted to survive in the struggle for existence, but from having gained an advantage over other males. And that was his definition of sexual selection uh, 12 years later in Selection in Relation to Sex, a later book. Now there's also the power of female choice. So sexual selection obviously isn't just the work of males competing. And if females have control over who they mate with and can exercise choice, those choices can themselves act as a selective force. And in relation to this, uh, what's called Bateman's principle points out that reproductive strategies uh, should diverge by sex. And Bateman's reasoning was that males are producing low-cost sperm and they incur very few of the cost of reproduction, whereas females are producing very high-cost eggs plus incubation plus nursing. So females have a very costly uh, reproductive process where males have a very low-cost process. And the idea then from this is that more matings for males, given the low cost of sperm, will lead to more offspring, and this should lead males to seek as many matings as possible, whereas more matings for females won't increase the number of offspring, and females then should try to uh, choose the best mates from those available. The idea here is that there's greater reproductive differentials between males, as in the case of the uh, bull elephant seals, than there is between females. And we're going to question this in just a minute. So the human condition is a little different. Um, human per, humans produce a very slow to develop high cost offspring. So in this sense, if females take over the whole cost of uh, caring for offspring, their reproductive costs are much higher than males. In addition, we find in humans, so shorter, not longer birth spacing than we find in closely related primates. So this is the puzzle, is that human uh, mothers seem to produce uh, more offspring than they can possibly care for. And that's uh, Sarah Hurdy's principle that mothers need help, right? If uh, the birth spacing is getting shorter, but the cost of offspring is getting higher, uh, mothers need help. And there's been two key hypotheses on where that help comes from. The first focuses on fatherhood and the evolution of fatherhood. The second focuses on grandmothers. And Sarah Hurdy's book will be focusing on grandmothers. So the fatherhood argument has stressed pair bonding, the evolution of stable pair bonding, and along with that, the development of bilateral filiation, or rights through both mother and father that we talked about earlier. The grandmother hypothesis argues that this will be associated with the development of matrilines and alloparental care. So as you're reading mothers and others, right, the question is who are the key others who are assisting mothers in human societies? Is it fathers or is it grandmothers and other closely related relatives and sometimes non-kin? Now all of this would be a lot easier to explain if human behavior was less facultative and again, facultative behavior varies according to ecological situation. And there's a lot of complexity, a causal complexity, in sorting out how adaptation has operated to shape human behavior. And as an example, we'll look at the Mpimbwe of Tanzania. And the Mpimbwe were studied by Monique Bergerhoff Mulder over the last decade. And she poses the question, are there sex differences in reproductive success among the Mpimbwe? And her finding is that yes, there are. Um, but what she found is not what we would predict based on Bateman's principle. So the Mpimbwe uh, practice like Americans serial monogamy. 
uh, one spouse at a time, but divorce is frequent and relationships are fragile. And so generally individuals might be married several times or more over the length of their life. And in relation to this, then she looked at the fertility of men and women. Uh, for males, the range was from zero conceptions to 17. And so the measure of fertility for men was how many offspring are conceived. And the average per man uh, works out to 8.41. The female range is from zero to 15 births. So for females, the measure of fertility is how many live births. And the average was 8.17. And actually, there's no statistically significant difference then between female uh, fertility and male fertility, contrary to Bateman's ex expectations, which were based not on humans. But what's even more interesting, and that is that if we look at the distributions uh, rather than the, just the averages, uh, we find that male and female fertility is very similar in its distribution. So here I've charted this, and you'll see, well, there's a more female fertility grouped uh, from seven births to 13, but there's a similar kind of curve uh, for both males and females. So there is reproductive skew, but in fact, there's a very wide range of reproductive success for both males and females, and the bulk of male and female reproductive success is grouped together. So this is contrary to Bateman's principle. Um, fertility, however, is not the same thing as reproductive success. So these are different concepts. You measure them differently. And the reason is that having a child is no guarantee that child is going to survive and reproduce itself. So Bergerhoff Mulder defines reproductive success as how many children survive to age five. And the male range is 0 to 12 children, with an average of right at 6. The female range, 0 to 12 children, with the average just over 6. And again, there's no statistically significant difference between men and women among the Mpimbwe. And even more interesting, their distributions are again very similar. So in both uh, fertility and reproductive success, in fact, we don't see this uh, great gap between male reproductive success and female. Um, there's as much uh, variation among females as males. But that's not what's most interesting. That's interesting. But what's really interesting is that Bergerhoff Mulder found that men fell to benefit from multiple marriages. And what this means is that for males, more partners did not translate into higher reproductive success. However, she found that women who married three or more times had more surviving offspring. Their fertility did not increase, but their reproductive success increased. And this means that for females, more partners does equal higher reproductive success. And of course, this inverts Bateman's principle. So I hope you uh, note from this that we're not trying to uh, reduce the complexity of human uh, variation and also the importance of deciding on measures and collecting data. And often that data can surprise us in what it shows. Thank you for listening.